OK, let's get back to Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. My series of programmes that aim to bring some of the unsung heroes of astronomy to the fore. Their contributions to astronomy, enabling the more well-known names we know to make their groundbreaking discoveries. Dark Matter. These two words might conjure up fantastical ideas from science fiction, vague imaginings about the contents of the universe, or questions about how much we really know about the mysteries of space. It might sound esoteric or strange, like something that belongs deep in the realm of elusive theoretical physics, but as far as we can tell, dark matter makes up about 85% of all the matter in our universe, and we see signs of it everywhere now that we know what we're looking for. Since its discovery in the 1970s, we've learned a lot about what dark matter does. We study dark matter indirectly by studying its gravity, looking at how the presence of dark matter affects the motion of stars and gas and dust. We see signs of dark matter in our study of the cosmic microwave background and in the shape of our own galaxy. But as its name would suggest, when it comes to seeing this ubiquitous part of our universe, we're in the dark. Dark matter does not appear to interact with light in any way. It doesn't emit light at any wavelength, so we don't detect any faint hiss in radio waves or any dim glow in visible light. It also doesn't absorb light, so we don't see any telltale shadows or black clouds alerting to us to its presence. As far as we can tell, dark matter doesn't do anything to light at all, and we're still not sure why that is. Today, physicists and astronomers are debating exactly what dark matter is, what it's made of, how it works, and what it means for the fundamental makeup of our universe. Studying dark matter is now an active and exciting subfield, all in its own within astrophysics. I think we can all agree that studying something we can't see and discovering one of the crucial building blocks of the cosmos is an immense and heroic path of scientific discovery. This program will focus on Vera Rubin, the discoverer of dark matter and founder of an entire new corner of physics, and how her pioneering work is still driving the way we study dark matter today. Vera Rubin was born in Philadelphia in 1928, the daughter of Jewish immigrants who had met while working at the Bell Telephone Company. As a child, she would peer out the back window of the family car while they drove home from her grandmother's house, puzzling over the trees and hills speeding past while the moon hung steady and unmoving in the sky. She would lie in bed and close one eye and then the other noticing how the pictures that hung on her bedroom wall seemed to jump back and forth. Young and curious and thrilled at the scientific mysteries that seemed to be everywhere, her questions about how things moved and her eagerness to explain the motion she saw would eventually prove invaluable for the entire field of astrophysics. Rubin received a scholarship from Vassar College, and finished her degree in 1948 after only three years, taking astronomy coursework during the school year and carrying out research during the summers. She then earned her master's degree from Cornell and a PhD from Georgetown, studying the motion and clustering of distant galaxies and went on to work at Georgetown for the next decade. While teaching a graduate class at Georgetown in 1962, Rubin posed a unique challenge to her students, asking whether they could use data from cutting-edge star catalogues to measure the rotation curve of the Milky Way. To understand what a rotation curve is, let's start by imagining how a galaxy like our Milky Way moves. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, with most of its mass concentrated in the centre and wispy arms of stars, gas and dust reaching out to the galaxy's edges. We know from studying the motion of stars and gas in these types of galaxies that they spin, but describing exactly how they spin is an interesting question. Let's imagine a simple scientific plot. On the horizontal axis, we can measure how far away a star or clump of gas is from the centre of the galaxy. 
On the vertical axis we can measure velocity or how fast that star or clump of gas is moving. The shape that this plot makes can tell us how an object's location in a galaxy is related to its speed and that in turn can tell us a lot about what a galaxy is made of and how it works. It doesn't sound too hard to figure out what a galaxy is made of. We can simply observe it with a telescope and use the light we capture to figure out the amount of matter that we're looking at. The trick comes when we try to figure out exactly how that matter is distributed in the galaxy. Let's imagine a galaxy that's built like a solid disk, spinning like a turntable or a merry-go-round. If we measure the speed of several points on that spinning disk, we can see that the points closer to the centre of the galaxy move more slowly, while points closer to the edge move faster. It's a physics phenomenon. It's a physics phenomenon that every child on a playground understands. Standing further out by the edge of a merry-go-round gives you a better ride. In a solid disk galaxy, this would mean the stars near the edge of the galaxy have higher velocities, and so the rotation curve of that galaxy would look like a straight line. However, we know that galaxies aren't actually solid disks. There's a lot of empty space sitting between the clumps of mass in our galaxy that we see as stars or gas or dust. In this way, the motion of objects in the galaxy might bear some resemblance to the motion of something like our solar system, with small masses orbiting a large centre. In the 17th century, Johannes Kepler calculated physical laws for the motion of planets orbiting our Sun. Kepler's third law stated that planets further away from the Sun would move more slowly with a speed proportional to 1 over the square root of the distance. According to Kepler, the rotation curve of a galaxy would look like a decreasing curve. When Rubin first started studying the motion of stars in the Milky Way with her class in 1962, most astronomers expected that a real galaxy's rotation curve would look like a combination of the two curves, an increasing line near the centre of the galaxy where the densely packed core would act like a solid body, and a decreasing curve throughout the rest of the galaxy following Kepler's third law. However, Rubin and her students found something else. As they measured the rotation of the stars further and further from the galaxy centre, the rotation curve was strangely flat. It did not decrease as would be expected for stars obeying Kepler's laws of motion. Rubin sent the results of her class's research to the Astronomical Journal, but it was met with scepticism. The journal originally did not want to publish the paper with students as authors, and only agreed to credit the students once she threatened to withdraw the paper. After its publication, Rubin continued to receive critical comments, declaring that the strange flat shape of the curve must be incorrect or based on flawed data. It would be nearly two decades before the implications of this flat shape became clear. Over the next few years, Rubin continued studying the velocities of stars in and beyond the Milky Way. In 1965, she moved to a new job at the Carnegie Institution of Washington and began working with another astronomer, Kent Ford. Ford had grown up and gone to school in Virginia, studying physics and carrying out his PhD research between the University of Virginia and Carnegie. When he began working with Rubin, he had also recently developed a groundbreaking new tool for capturing astronomical data, the Carnegie Image Tube. At the time, most telescopes still used fairly straightforward photographic plates and camera setups. The plates would be treated with chemical emulsions that react to light, loaded into a telescope's camera and then exposed during observations. The emulsions on the plate would eventually darken as it was hit by photons, preserving a record of the light it collected. However, to get a clear image, astronomers needed a lot of photons to hit a plate. This meant that capturing data from dimmer objects like faraway galaxies could take hours or even 
days of effort. Ford's new image tube took advantage of something called the photoelectric effect. When photons with a specific amount of energy hit a material, something like a thin coating of metal, the material will emit electrons. By the middle of the 20th century, physicists also understood how to focus and multiply electrons. This meant that even tiny amounts of light could be detected by shining the light onto a photosensitive material, capturing the electrons produced by the photoelectric effect, and multiplying these electrons until you had a powerful electronic signal. Finally, Ford's image tube took advantage of something called a phosphor screen, which would emit photons when electrons hit it, and was similar to technology used in early TV screens. Putting it all together, the net effect was that a few photons would enter one end of the tube, and by magnifying the photoelectric effect, a ton of corresponding photons would come out of the other end through the phosphor screen. By photographing from the far end of the tube, you could take brilliant and detailed images that would have been far too dim to capture directly. Ford's invention revolutionised the power of telescopes. Exposing a photographic plate to the sky and waiting for it to darken into a clear picture as photons from a star or galaxy hit it might take five hours. Using Ford's image tube the process would only take 30 minutes. Rubin recognised the potential of this technique. The ability to study very faint objects meant that she could zoom in on incredibly distant stars or gas clumps or other galaxies far beyond our own Milky Way and measure their speeds. Together in 1970 Rubin and Ford were able to measure the rotation curve of the Andromeda galaxy, the Milky Way's nearest neighbour. Again the rotation curve came out flat. No matter how many galaxies Rubin and Ford studied, and they observed dozens, the results stubbornly remained the same. Galaxy rotation curves do not obey Kepler's law of motion. Even though everything about the galaxy's appearances suggested they should. After puzzling over the results for months, Rubin realised that the data could be explained perfectly if we moved away from what we saw. If the galaxies had invisible halos of matter, around five to ten times as much as the stars, gas and dust combined suggested, they would have the flat rotation curves she had been observing since the 1962 class at Georgetown. She had identified the first indirect observational evidence of dark matter. Vera Rubin didn't coin the term dark matter. And she wasn't the first astronomer to imagine the existence of some sort of mysterious mass in the universe. The phrase dark matter was first used by French mathematician Henri Poincaré, who used matière obscure to describe hard-to-observe matter. Swiss-American astronomer Fritz Wicke used the term dunkel matière, dark matter again to explain his observations of an enormous cluster of galaxies. The galaxies he claimed had far too little visible mass to explain their ability to stick together in a cluster. Some vast amount of unseen mass must be responsible. The name dark matter stuck, but it's a bit misleading given what we know now. Both Poincare and Zwicky simply imagined dark matter as well dark incredibly cold, dim stars or clouds or gas made of the same normal matter as everything else but simply very difficult to observe. Physicists now believe that dark matter is a distinct and unique type of matter that doesn't interact with light at all. A very dim star or a cloud of cold dust would emit at least a tiny amount of light or block light from background objects. Even something like a cluster of black holes would have an observable signature by way of how it interacted with light. We'd see the gravity of those black holes bending the light that passed near them. What we call dark matter might be better imagined as invisible matter. It doesn't interact with electromagnetic light at all. 
Still, we've still seen plenty of evidence for dark matter thanks to the effects of its mass. Vera Rubin's observations with Kent Ford showed us that the presence of dark matter in galaxies has a huge impact on how objects in those galaxies move, even if the dark matter itself remains elusive. In the years since, many other astronomers have measured the same flat rotation curves that Vera and Kent found, confirming that dark matter is ubiquitous in galaxies throughout our universe. There are other telltale signatures of dark matter. Many spiral galaxies, even with their halos of dark matter, appear as flat spirals, but others look a little bent like somebody reached out and twisted the disk of the galaxy. This shape comes from little satellite galaxies orbiting around the larger spirals and passing through their dark matter halos. The motion of these satellites through the larger galaxy's dark matter can actually warp the shape of the spiral's disk. We have observed examples of this in other galaxies and have even seen this telltale warping in the disk of our own Milky Way. We also see the effects of dark matter thanks to something called gravitational lensing. We will talk about this in a future program, but for now it's enough to note that we know that all matter has mass. Mass has gravity and gravity can bend space-time. When space-time is bent, the light that travels through it follows the bent path, making it look like it's travelled through a curved lens. We call this gravitational lensing. This lensing effect is especially dramatic when caused by extremely massive objects like huge black holes or enormous galaxies. Studying the bend of the lens can tell us how much mass is there, warping space-time, and we know from studying gravitational lenses that some galaxies are much more massive than they appear, another sign of dark matter. Even the cosmic microwave background supports the existence of dark matter. The anisotropies we learned about in the previous programmes Tiny, hot and cold patches that deviate from the model of a perfect uniform early universe are best explained by a model for our universe that includes the expansion of the universe and the presence of something known as cold dark matter. As with the word dark, the word cold here is a bit of a misnomer. It refers to the motion of dark matter in the early universe and suggests that the dark matter in this model couldn't have moved very far. In this model dark matter helps explain how the first galaxies in the universe formed and the theory agrees excellently with our observations of the universe. Jim Peebles, one of the astrophysicists who studied the cosmic microwave background, won the 2019 Nobel Prize in part for his work on the theory of cold dark matter. Although there are more than a dozen different observations that demonstrate the existence of dark matter, about 85% of all matter in the known universe is dark matter, and it's everywhere we look, even if we don't see it directly. Dominating the mass of galaxies and driving how these galaxies and the properties of the universe have evolved. We now know that this mysterious invisible matter discovered by Rubin and Ford plays a crucial role in how the cosmos works. What we don't know yet is what dark matter is actually made of. Nobody has ever detected the dark matter particle. We are not even sure dark matter is a particle, although most astrophysicists today believe that an as yet undiscovered subatomic particle is the most likely explanation for what dark matter is made of. For a long time, two competing theories for dark matter were machos and wimps. They sound like ridiculous names, but they're really just slightly silly acronyms. Macho stands for Massive Compact Halo Objects and refers to the idea that dark matter could be explained by the sorts of objects that Fritz Zwicky imagined. Heaps of black holes, old cold stars and other objects, massive and compact and hanging out in the halos around galaxies. However, most evidence does not favour machos as an explanation. 
If dark matter could be explained by big, dark, compact objects, we would expect to see tiny amounts of gravitational lensing from these individual objects, and so far no observations have seen these effects. The cosmic microwave background also strongly suggests that dark matter is made of matter that doesn't interact with light at all. It's truly invisible, rather than just dark, as the macho's theory would suggest. What about WIMPs? WIMPs stands for Weakly Interacting Massive Particles. This theory and other related particle physics theories are where most current research on dark matter is focused. Most theories predict that dark matter could be made of some new elementary particle that simply hasn't been observed yet. Many different research groups are actively engaged in pursuits to find signs of dark matter particles, hoping to directly observe signs of dark matter particles interacting with other particles or even with each other. Every day these experiments make progress on understanding how dark matter could work and what it might be, but so far nobody has conclusively detected signs of dark matter particles. We've learned a great deal about how dark matter works and what it does to its surroundings, but when it comes to answering the question of what dark matter actually is, we still don't know. What we do know is that dark matter has had an immense influence on physics and astronomy. It has changed our understanding of how galaxies work, shaped our current explanation of how the cosmos has evolved, and spawned an entirely new subfield and numerous observational and laboratory experiments dedicated to understanding this mysterious phenomenon. It seems impossible to ignore the enormous impact that Vera Rubin's discovery of dark matter has had on the world of science, and organisations all over the world have agreed. For her work she was awarded the National Medal of Science in 1993, an honour bestowed by the President of the United States to those who have made vital contributions to the sciences. Her research received the James Craig Watson Medal from the National Academy of Sciences and the Gruber Cosmology Prize and the Dickinson Prize in Science. She received the Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society, the Henry Norris Russell Lectureship from, from the American Astronomical Society and numerous other Lifetime Achievements Award. She also earned the Richtmeyer Memorial Award, a prestigious award recognising outstanding physics education in the United States that includes more than a dozen Nobel laureates among their, its recipients. Unfortunately, Rubin passed away in 2016. As a result, the venerated Nobel Prize in Physics which cannot be awarded posthumously and was not awarded to Ruby during her lifetime despite her immense contribution to the field, now permanently lacks any recognition of one of the most groundbreaking discovery in physics in the 20th century. Today Vera Rubin has a prize of her own. The Vera Rubin Early Career Prize is awarded annually by the American Astronomical Society's Division on Dynamical Astronomy a division specifically devoted to studying the dynamics and motions of stars and galaxies. Physicists and astronomers all over the world continue studying dark matter in the hopes of learning more about how it works and what it's made of. And a new observatory in the Andean foothills of Chile, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, built to repeatably survey the entire southern sky and study new mysteries of the universe has been renamed the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. She is the first woman to have a national US observatory named after her. We will be talking more about that observatory in a later programme. In our next programme we'll cover two of the most fundamental questions that this observatory will explore and one of the many areas that dark matter has left permanently changed, how did the universe begin, and how will it end? <laughs>